wherein uh, the value of food is based on the labor that goes into it. Uh, so if I were to use the example of my laptop, one might say it costs what it does or it's worth what it is because a bunch of laborers in some sweatshop in China work very hard, risking their bodies and so forth to put it together. That would be a Marxist idea of value. One might say, to go back to a natural resource theory of value, that this computer is worth what it is because it has silicon and it has a lot of other materials that are fairly expensive, lithium in the battery, uh, and all of those things have to be mined out of the ground and they are scarce. They're not replaceable or renewable. Uh, but generally, we operate on a theory of value now uh, of markets. Okay? And so we would say this computer is worth what it is, about $2,000, because Dell only makes so many of them, and there are only so many people prepared to buy them, and the supply and bed balance out at the price of the computer. Uh, so in fact, that, that idea of a natural resource-driven development is actually a little surprising that it has such staying power because it's based on an economic theory that's two generations or 200 years old at this point. Uh, so I'm going to explain to you why in Africa in particular, uh, I'm going to explain to you using two examples, why in Africa that resource cure, resource driven development has often not panned out, it often hasn't worked that way, and has often led to exactly the opposite outcome, which I call the resource cure. That is, a society richly endowed in a certain kind of mineral, or a certain kind of landscape, or a certain biota of plants and animals, richly endowed in these resources that we would expect to hold value. Actually, in the exploitation of those resources, is driven into greater poverty, misery, conflict, famine, violence, and so on. Okay, I'm going to give you two examples. We can discuss at length two examples of this resource cure of plants. The first, you may have already guessed, the first is oil, uh, and the second is wilderness. Uh, so let me tell you a tiny bit about the oil. I'm going to show you some images uh, made by the photographer Ed Kitch, who's um, kind of a labor photographer, uh, lives in Montclair, and has recently published a book. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's all published So this is the way we like to think about oil. Well, we like to think about, is that, uh, maybe I will, maybe I will turn on to the, um, to the, uh, ah, uh, very good, ah, uh, very good, okay. Yeah, we like to think that oil is extracted in this way from an offshore platform by a French company such as Total, very clean, right? Uh, where the wealth is coming out of the ground the product is coming out of the ground for the use in, in this seamless way to produce petroleum, gasoline, and other products, and so on, and fuel development. But in fact, that's not really, this is on a platform of offshore in Nigeria, <coughs> off the Niger Delta. Um, but in fact, it looks more like this quite often. Here is a, is a neighborhood in the Delta where their pipeline's going immediately through the neighborhood, carrying crude and other products to refineries or to offshore or to onshore to loading platforms and so forth. Um, and this is how people uh, often live. This is uh, some flaring going on, again, in densely populated areas. Um, and then what's uh, astonishingly what people do is she's drying tapioca, which is an agricultural product, drying it in the flare, uh, in the heat of the flare, um, which then, of course, deposits a horrendous array of toxins on the tapioca, um, leading to all sorts of illnesses in a shorter life, very short life expectancy in the Niger Delta. Uh, and you may have heard of some of the violence associated with this. this these, are, these are some photos that it actually got quite remarkable of uh, men, that is the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, are a group of people who are, are, are in fact, uh, attacking oil platforms has been some of this recently, in the news recently, uh, and threatening, sabotaging, it's been called terrorism, but I would call it industrial sabotage, practicing sabotage against Shell, uh, and Elf, and some of the other companies operating. So this very violent, very militarized kind of place, and at the same time, one where the health hazards, the environmental health hazards, are just, uh, just horrific and something that we really can't imagine. Uh, happening in, in, in the United States in a context where we're more familiar. 
So this is the uh, resource curse. Uh, I want to I suggest to you that um, Nigeria is not an outlaw. The Niger Delta, in fact, has in extreme form many of the qualities of, of that the company oil extraction wherever you go. Okay? That this conjuncture of oil, environmental hazards, controlling environmental hazards, and violence occurs repeatedly throughout the world. And that conjunction of qualities has a lot to do with what you might call the, 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 the physical, the biophysical qualities of oil and the political qualities of oil. So let's think about that. Um, oil requires enormous amounts of capital to extract. So if we go here, these kinds of things don't come for free. Uh, there are only a very limited number of corporations that can afford to build offshore platforms like this and operate them and so forth. Okay? So, um, so we're going to have very wealthy, very powerful corporations with an incredible amount of sunk costs that they want to protect and profit from. But the carrying costs on a platform are we have millions of dollars per day. So you don't want to even shut down production for an hour or two. Okay? Now, um, the oil itself is uh, volatile, right? It, um, of course, as a hydrocarbon, it uh, can oxidize very quickly, which is, of course, what we see going on here with the natural gas flaring. Um, and that volatility, combustibility, gives it its capacity to generate energy in the first place, to combust and to release energy to power a car or a generator, whatever you might want to do. Um, also, though, um, in order to prevent uncontrolled combustion, you have to control the oil. Right? You have to put it in pipelines like this. And you have to make sure that it's under lock and key the whole time. And in fact, uh, what's rather remarkable about oil, given that it's such a uh, ubiquitous substance in a society like ours, is never, you never actually see it. Right? And if you did see it, if you did spill it, while putting it in the tank of your car, well, that's, that's something to worry about, right? So it's hidden from us by structures of containment all the time. And again, those structures of containment are very expensive. Uh, and there's only a small number of corporations that can manage them. Uh, and corporations man do manage them by you know, going, as I said, this total um, <coughs> platform brings oil through total-owned facilities all the way to gas stations in France and other companies, again, under the banner of Total. OK, so we said this is an expensive, high capital industry. Uh, what that means is that there's, a, there's, there's a, a need to control it centrally, because otherwise it's dangerous. Right? Otherwise, if you just have people selling gasoline on the side of the street, you can have explosions. Uh, when I was last living in Zimbabwe, the black market in diesel and gasoline was very high, and you had tend to have two kinds of problems. That either you would buy one of those fuels uh, from somebody on the side of the street, you'd put it in your truck, and you'd drive a few kilometers, and then everything would fall apart because somebody had adulterated the diesel with water. Uh, and in that case, you have you have to immediately empty your tank uh, on the ground. It's not good. You empty it immediately on the ground because it'll wreck the engine if you drive any distance with adulterated fuel. And then you have to try to get some more fuel and fill it up again. So that's another <coughs> another reason, well, another biophysical quality of gasoline is that it doesn't work unless it's pure. Yes, excuse me, petroleum products. They don't work unless they're pure. Uh, so from the consumer's point of view, you want central control over these fuels. Um, so there are all these reasons. These reasons, if I can summarize here, there are the capital costs drive centralized control. The explosivity, explosiveness of the gasoline calls for centralized authority, authoritative control. And the needs of the consumer for pure stuff also provide a very strong incentive for some corporation to get control of it. And when some corporation does get control of it, that corporation will be rewarded by loyalty from the consumer. Everybody prefers to buy gasoline from a gas station than buy it from some guy at the side of the road, even if it's cheaper, 
uh, at the side of the road. And the other problem, of course, was selling at the side of the road. And this happened in Zimbabwe too in those days. Is that if somebody loses control of the steering wheel and drives into a big tank of gasoline at the side of the road, they would have a big explosion that's going quite off. Uh, if you've heard of the situation in uh, in Kenya, Western Kenya, a couple of a couple of weeks ago, where a gas tanker drove off the side of the road and people were running and collecting the gasoline in bags and buckets and whatever, uh, and then somebody threw a cigarette into it. So gasoline is, is, a, is a product that requires a central control. Okay, so uh, what tends to happen is that national governments get control of, get of, the, of the fuel, of petroleum, either as national oil reserves or through a national company, um, a, uh, a, a parastatal company that, that controls the entire oil supply. All right, so once you have that centralized control, there's a tremendous amount of money to be made. Because oil is not actually bought and sold through the kinds of open markets that we think of. It's usually a monopsony, that is to say, one seller in any country. Um, and then at the international level, there's an oligopoly. oligopoly um, actually, being oligopsony, which is to say, a small group of sellers uh, controlling the market, um, and uh, OPEC, that is, and regulating the price and keeping the price reasonably high. So, you can, if you're one of these national oil companies, you can generate enormous rents, that's enormous profits through this oil. Um, now, once there are enormous profits to be made at the central level, there's every tendency to hold on to those profits and to accumulate them in the hands of a small clique. Small ruling class or ruling clique, which is what's happened in Nigeria. Uh, it's worse in Equatorial Guinea uh, it's better in Venezuela. It's uh, somewhere in the middle in this country, where we also have uh, a small class of people who've gotten very wealthy and very powerful, as well through control of the oil sector. Um, so, and the final, the final problem is that there's then a great deal of incentive to use violence in order to redistribute those rents, right? So that if uh, if in Nigeria. Uh, local people in the Niger Delta are paying that environmental cost in terms of shortened lives and polluted environments. Uh, and, and the money is being accumulated in the capital, in Abuja, or at least in Lagos, in the largest city, or is being accumulated overseas by a French corporation. Uh, that breeds a lot of discontent. And then if people are well enough armed, it, leads, it breeds violence and civil wars, which I'll show you. Okay? So in this way, the qualities of oil, the, fit with the chemical qualities of oil, combined with a political and economic, an elite controlled political and economic structure, breaks the conditions for violence and for the immiseration, impoverishment and immiseration of most of the people in oil producing regions. Um, Michael Watt, who's a geographer, has written about this and used a slightly different language, um, which I want to just introduce here because he describes it very richly. Uh, he describes oil as a magical commodity. Uh, and what's magical about it is that it concentrates so much energy in so little volume in such an easily transportable substance, or such an easily transportable medium, that states and corporations are nearly always tempted to hold on to, to seize and hold on to as much of it as they can, and to get as much for it as they can. Right? The temptation is too great. Uh, and this is what I'm going to come back to this at the end, I'm not going to suggest what we do about that. Um, but this is why oil almost always enriches a small group of people and leaves most of us either worse off or Okay, so that's that's the resource curse of that story, and why Nigeria has not become uh, you know, a, a developed country despite 40 years or so of uh, exporting oil at a very high rate. Um, I want to talk a little bit about wildlife now. Um, sorry, not wildlife, but more generally, wilderness. Uh, Africa has been known as a wild. I think we were up to 
discussing with Barbara the punctuation of your series and what the explanation of points meant. And maybe one thing it means is that Africa is just tremendous, has this image of being tremendously exotic, wild, even dangerous. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this idea and how it has established another uh, ambition of a resource pool for Africa's poverty. Um, Elspeth Huxley, who was the voice of white Kenya as a settler, wrote in 1959, towards the end of her life, each time you came to a grave, you had the feeling that you were the first person to stand upon that verge and gaze across the tufted grasses like Cortez and the Pacific, and that some extraordinary prehistoric animal would be browsing there. This is a remarkable thing to say about a continent. She was in fact describing, as I said, Kenya, describing the savannah in Kenya, which was very, well, I wouldn't say very densely populated, but certainly it was impossible to ignore <coughs> the presence of people living in complex <laughs> societies uh, and having done so for quite a long time. Uh, it's, and, and I don't quite understand. Uh, of course, Cortez, I, I'm not exactly sure what she means by Cortez either, but I think she's, she's looking at a model of conquistadors coming to an empty landscape, which was not empty in their case either. But this has been written about quite a bit by historians. The notion is it's called empty land discourse. Uh, and it's a European colonial uh, or ex an ex exploration, a narrative of exploration, going back to the 16th century or even earlier, uh, wherein the people living on the place were not seen. Uh, if seen, they were not considered people. If considered people, they were not considered worthy or meritorious enough to actually have a claim on the land. Okay? So, I don't know how to accuse Elspeth Huxley of that whole strain of train of thought, but I think she carried some of those assumptions when she wrote this paragraph uh, in 1959. And you see it again in an Italian journalist, Alberto Moravia, writes, Adam Gorogoro Crater, which is in Tanzania, I saw an immense panor panorama, typically African, in other words, prehistoric, a panorama of a kind that is to suggest dinosaurs, mammoths, flying dragons. Again, this is odd. Uh, why should a grassland in Africa suggest animals that are extinct and no longer exist and have existed for uh, the case of mammoths for 12,000 years or so, um, and flying dragons which never existed, <laughs> Why should it suggest something so otherworldly um, and outside of history that is prehistoric? Um, so finally, I want to tell you, I'll read, read one more passage from Lorenz van der Post, who's still living and is an Afrikaans, uh, Afrikaans writer, but he writes in English, uh, in South Africa. And he's describing his anatomy. Clara was a Bushman woman. Stone Age woman. I looked into her eyes, and it was always as if I looked at the first dawn of the first day. So here's somebody, here's an African person with whom Lawrence van der Post could have a relationship of equals, or at least some kind of a social relationship. Uh, like, he could have a discussion with her, and did, uh, but instead he treats her as some sort of Neanderthal and puts her beyond the pale of social discourse. And he was well known for being um, uh, an apologist, I wouldn't say an apologist, uh, sort of an apologist for a part. Um, of the sort where he felt that Africans lived in tribes and their customs should be preserved and they should not be organized as a unitary democratic citizenry, but rather should enjoy the preservation of their customs through a, through a tribal structure under Bachelor's stands and in the apartheid setup. Um, so, now you might say that all this is dreadfully racist, uh, and it is at one level. Um, but the surprising thing is that even, in, especially in South Africa, even in an era when one, one, one certainly would and articulate such sentiments, and they cannot be represented in institutions, they are perpetuated through tourism particularly through the photo tourism industry, which began after World War II. The photo tourism industry is founded 
on precisely this fantasy. That is, the fantasy that Africa is an empty landscape without people, or without people who have history. So it's, a, it's filled with the Stone Age. Um, and that it's a kind of a playground for the civilized world to go visit and have an exotic experience. Um, so that fantasy, that myth of wild Africa, as I said, it, it, it enters, it goes back much further, but it entered into mass tourism, uh, beginning with the jet, the, the preponderance of jet aircraft in the 1960s. And what's surprising is that it continued even after African governments, even after black people got control of the state through decolonization and started running governments and running the political economies of their own country. In a place I'm going to tell you about Zimbabwe, which is, which is Barbara says for most of my experience in Africa. But one would, one would ask, why in Zimbabwe? In 1980, when Robert Mugabe, who's now, of course, uh, uh, deservedly infamous, got control of the country in 1980, elected as president, why would someone like him, who had fought against racism and against white rule and prejudice, uh, and suffered mightily for it, why would he perpetuate this set of myths about the wild continent. Um, well, the answer, the answer is, is, is actually not that complicated. In this case, it just had to do with money. Uh, so that African governments, through their tourism boards uh, and their national airlines and so forth, made a deal and said essentially that in an implicit way, all right, we're going to indulge these wealthy white Westerners in their fantasies about Africa being a wild continent full of Stone Age people and so on. And they're going to give us money. They're going to give us foreign exchange, give us US dollars and pounds and so forth. Then we're going to get rich off this. And it's going to be worth the kind of, kind of indignities uh, and, and the small slights and insults and so forth that you get by people like Lauren Federer. Uh, so that is, again, a, a notion of the resource cure. That what African countries, particularly in East and Southern Africa, if you think about big safari places like Kenya, Tanzania, now Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe once was, uh, South Africa, uh, that they would actually export not so much uh, a natural resource that you could hold like wild, but an experience with nature. And people would pay lots of money, thousands of, thousands of dollars. I mean, a hunting safari would pay 800 to 1,000 dollars US per day. Uh, on a photo safari, you could on a high end one, you could even play $300 per day. Uh, plus the airlines and so forth. So this could be the cash cow for African development. Um, now everybody was aware of one of the immediate costs. One of the immediate costs is that you have to create the landscape that the tourists expect to see. <laughs> right? So you actually have to get rid of the people. Uh, and we have some experience with this in the US. I mean, if you know of uh, the, the first national parks, arguably, first official national park was created at Yellowstone in, in 1871 and involved expelling the black feet and I'm not sure exactly which tribes. The same thing happened in Yosemite with the expulsion of Indians and the erasure of their history. So that um, the, um, the marketers or the officials running the national park can represent it as this kind of, this kind of edenic wild prehistoric place. Or you have to make it that way and there's a social cost to that. People are pushed out of the ancestral <coughs> lands where their lives are supposed to exist and pushed onto the edges of the national park and made to eke out a living in these kinds of very inferior circumstances. And every time you go to a national park, as I've been to in southern Africa, you will find <coughs> cluster on the edges of it, at the gates, uh, people with land claims uh, to, to that land, going back perhaps generations, perhaps only five or ten years, nursing these claims and, and uh, immiserated them, in any case, with their livelihoods damaged by that expulsion. Um, I'm going to tell you how, in fact, how entrenched this expulsion is um, by giving you a little example of a project that I worked on in Zimbabwe 10 years ago or so that was designed to reconcile these offices. It was designed to actually allow tourism to go on where people live. All right? So the plan was, uh, was known as Campfire, that's the Communal Areas Management Program for Indigenous Resources. I don't expect you to memorize that, we'll just call it Campfire. And the idea was that tourism 
would, would, would lose out of the national parks in Zimbabwe, which at that point, in the, in the tourism boom in the 1990s, were saturated, and people would drive around, and they would see mostly other tourists rather than <laughs> animals in the forest. So it was just getting to be too full, too crowded, and the value was decreasing. So we would bring people to the, for those communities in what are known as communal lands, precisely where these, the sons and daughters of the Ebiktees live, bring tourists there, and the Ebiktees would then make money by selling various tourism services. So I spent, I did my dissertation research in this place, uh, which is known as Vimba, on the border with Mozambique. These are the Mr. Uh, Mrs. and Mrs. Zuse, two wives of Mugu Zuse, who I spent a lot of time with, growing sweet potatoes. Uh, and this does not look, uh, you might already uh, imagine, does not look like a wild landscape. It looks like a very inhabited landscape. Um, it is immediately next to Chimani Mani National Park, which has exactly the history of what I described. First, first created in 1968, and then expanded in 1974. And people were evicted from this Peroni Valley area there. And if you go there, you can still see house posts from people's houses and the evidence of the cultivated fields and so forth. And all because of this range of mountains, which are very scenic and so forth. I'm not exactly sure why they felt the need to clear people out of the valley as well, but the, uh, the National Parks Department did. So um, to the south of this area, which is to say in the foreground of the picture, there is a communal land, uh, Ngorima communal land, named after the chief Ngorima. Uh, which contains a forest um, of high canopy, moist forest, the sort of thing you would call a tropical rainforest. Um, and the um, campfire program thought, well, let's bring tourists there. Tourists never, <coughs> tourists never came here. In fact, it was very difficult to get to, and it wasn't advertised anywhere, and the road would wash out, things like that. So, and there was no place to stay or anything like that. So they said, let's bring people there. Uh, and establish some sort of area with a campsite, and people in Vimba, people like the Luze wives, could run uh, that, um, that set of campsites, or chalets, or a little tiny lodge, or something like that. Okay? Um, the difficult thing was that um, spatially there was a blunt instrument here, because the same problem emerged that the tourists would have to, even on the planning stages of this, it was clear that the tourists would not want to see cultivation. So the planners of this campfire program said to the people running this banana plantation, right next to the forest, the forest is in the background there, you see, and there's this whole banana plantation here. And in order to get to the banana, to the forest, you've got to pass through the banana plantation. I said, well, this is really very unfortunate here. Um, can we do anything about this banana plantation? Can we remove it and allow the forest to grow back? <coughs> or describe it differently, or make it smaller, or something like that. And so this was very odd, because this banana plantation was sponsored by another arm of government. Uh, so you had two arms of government, with two different, uh, in fact, both of them, in some way, environmentally driven development plans coming into conflict. But the bigger conflict still was about these two guys, who were on the edge of the same forest, slightly upslope on the edge of the same forest, uh, and they cut a field practicing shifting cultivation, uh, which is to say uh, they cut the floor, they cut secondary forest, but it was still had fairly large, large trunks there uh, and piled up all the branches and we're going to burn them to try to burn them <coughs> so they would have fertile soil to grow. Um, but this type of thing is just totally unacceptable, right on the edge of what was to be the tourist area. So they were evicted. They were in fact sent back to Mozambique, which is right here, which is where they had come from some years previously. Um, and pushed out. Okay, so this is the difficult thing. I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you about it a little bit. This is the difficult thing because as ecotourism, as the profits or the potential profits <coughs> increase, the program, the staff of the program insisted more and more vehemently that the, the wild areas had to be truly wild and had to be demarcated off from the cultivated areas. And it wasn't enough to just draw a line in the sand and say, okay, well, here's wilderness and here's the cultivated areas. The wilderness, uh, sorry, excuse me, the cultivated areas have to, have to be rendered invisible. Because if you're sitting there in your Stone Age wilderness 
and you see right next to it somebody growing crops in a modern way. In fact, the bananas were under irrigation. So you see sprinkler irrigation going around <laughs> and a pump pumping water. Um, somehow that wild. So, so what, the, the, what happened was that the, what, the ecotourism was putting down a very large footprint and clearing out in the plant, clearing from its entire vicinity, from its entire visual catchment, you might say, entire line of sight, all cultivation, all signs of other forms of development. <coughs> Okay. Uh, and this didn't generate the type of violence that we see in Nigeria, certainly. But it did generate a lot of a lot. <coughs> and so this man, towards the end of my field with him, this man had been chiparing, said Bajagagisus, which means they have eaten us. Now there will be Chimaranga number two. But which he meant he was referring back to Chimaranga number one, which it's actually it's getting a lot of too big stuff, but he was referring back to the independent struggle, which is known as the Chimaranga in the 1970s, the little war, which was very hot in this area, and say, we're going to do this again. This is Henry Chikar here. We're going to do this again <coughs> if these people come, just as the whites did, and try to force us out of our land. OK, so why should this kind of conflict ensue? Uh, what, in fact, deeply embedded in the campfire program and in many programs of wilderness was a certain spatial logic. This is a chart from a manual um, put out by, uh, actually, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF's office in Harare, in Zimbabwe, showing what they imagined. As I say, the program was an improvement on what had existed before. What had existed before was this protected area um, with the communal land, where displaced people lived, and others people lived there practicing agriculture. And the plan had been to bring the benefits of ecotourism into this communal land. But, as I said, the tourists don't want to see signs of cultivation. They particularly, in, in more savanna areas, particularly didn't want to see cattle. So it was then necessary to put the cattle and the crops and the people in this fenced area here. Okay, and then this would be the wildlife viewing area. And there are all sorts of reasons why, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're interested in watching game species, why you don't want to mix game species with cattle. <coughs> uh, excuse me, I'm fading that there. Uh, partly what happens is you have a species like king buffalo or wildebeest, and they tend to uh, almost domesticate themselves if they're grazing with cattle. So they'll kind of bunch up with the cattle, and they'll become very docile, and they'll just wander along with the cattle. <laughs> and things like that. And so, for the tourist who wants to see the wild, this is no fun at all. Why don't they be a tough village of the cops? But what's the point? Um, and there's also the issues of diseases being transmitted through cattle wild. Uh, so, oh, and then the other problem. One of the assumptions about cattle herders is that they're all hunters, they're all uh, kind of uh, opportunistic hunters. So if you have somebody herding cattle out there and you turn your back on it, he will kill that. He'll kill that. I'll follow there. Right? So, um, so there was a further partition then. And what happened, and this is what started to happen in Vimba, but it didn't happen because Chiquari raised the alarm and, and shut the whole program down. But what happened in other areas of Zimbabwe is that in fact the wildlife area, which had only been here, expanded into all this area. And these people, and the people which had previously had, had at least this area, were then squeezed in behind this fence here. Okay? Now, you might say that, well, that's okay, because at least they're making money off of the tourism. Right? That's the whole point of the program. Um, for people now, nah, but what happens with tourism? Tourism is a little bit like petroleum in the sense that rents tend to accumulate centrally. Um, and it's not, it's not hard to see why. Um, if you are some people like Chipari, like uh, Henry Chipari or the Zuzes, you're not really in a position to market your tourism product to Europeans and North Americans. And, and not even in a position to market it to urban elites in Harada or Johannesburg or something like that. Um, you have to, that takes a lot of money. Now it takes access to the web. Um, it takes connections. 
Uh, you're going to be in a much better position to do that if you have all those things. And if you're a white African with relatives and friends and so forth and the ability to travel to Europe, you're going to be in a really good position to make money off of tourism. And so what has tended to happen is that tourism, money made from tourism largely goes to airlines, uh, to hotels, which are run, well, airlines are nationally run at least, although if it's British Airways, then the money is being accumulated in Britain. So they tend to go back to European airlines flying to Africa. They go to hotel chains that are European owned or owned by the wealthiest strata of African society. Uh, they go to the kind of tour operators and people who drive you around in a minibus and so forth, the transfer companies. They go to all these companies and then if you're lucky, if the community is lucky, some people will get off a bus and buy baskets being sold by the side of the road and somebody in the local community will actually make a dollar or two by selling these baskets. It's an interesting experiment if you happen to be a tourist in a poor country as it's just at the end of the day trying to figure out how much money you actually put into poor local communities and how much money you put into corporations run by national or international elites. Uh, and it tends to be that the poorer the country, the less money is actually going to local people. Um, so, I'm rounding it off here. Um, right. Let me uh, bring you to the end. Let me suggest that this resource curse, um, I'm not going to say it's a, it's a universal law, but for poor countries, it tends to um, natural resources tend to lead to the accumulation of rents at the top strata and when, and, and when generating degrees of protest and when protest gets bad enough with degrees of violent repression. So what are we going to do about this? Um, oil, I'm going to suggest to you that it's not really resources anyway. Um, oil is just past biomass sequestered in a fashion that has made, made this the, the climate stability and therefore human society, especially around coastlines, possible. We are able to, to live on coastlines because we have the climate stability, which has to do with the fact that we're in an interglacial period, but also more fundamentally has to do with the fact that we have that much sequestered carbon allowing mammalian life and the kind of seasonal health are fairly, fairly cool average surface temperatures to prevail. Um, and so and once you drill them up and burn them, then one releases a Pandora's box, which is to say releasing the ancient hot reptilian climates, which we can't survive in spring. We arguably can't survive, but certainly can't prosper. Um, so it's much, oil is actually much more useful to us in the ground than in the air. Uh, and precisely that combustibility, which I said generates all of this political control and political repression, again, it leads to oxidation, which leads to all of these cool problems at a global and planetary scale. So the solution to oil is not to burn it. Uh, and that the high consuming societies, such as our own, simply have to stop burning controlling as quickly as we can. Uh, and I'm not going to join the, uh, the group of people saying we have to clean up oil in the Niger Delta. And so forth. It's not the cleaning it up, it's not enough, although that would be helpful for people in the Niger Delta but there's no way to actually make it safe. Uh, regarding wilderness, uh, there's, there's, there's more, more promising forms of compromise. Um, again, it's not really a resource. It's an imaginary resource. It's, it's, it's a fantasy, this idea of a stone age, prehistoric landscape with, uh, with dragons and so forth running around. It's a fantasy that is sold on in the way Disneyland sells fantasy. Um, and one might say that, in the interest of honesty, uh, one should just just try to to puncture this myth, right? To, to dispel it with the clear light of truth. Um, but every time I try to do that, people say, "Ah, oh, you're being so unhelpful and so provocative, and can you just get off and get into the real world?" So, in the interest of being in the real world, I'm going to talk at this moment about a very uh, another photographer, Stephen Robinson, who's uh, Zambia has um, developed this way of super wide angle of photos that he takes. And so, and, and he his photos up until very recently were the typical thing 
of this kind of landscape, and you know, he predicted, I think it goes around 180, 273, the photos he takes of landscapes. And, but then he went to, and I met him when he did it, he went to Victoria Falls, which I'm sure you've heard of, it's this enormous waterfall, the biggest by width, or the height, the enormous waterfall, <laughs> in, in, on the Zimbabwe Zambia border. And what you can tell from this photo, this aerial shot here, is that it's actually uh, not a wilderness, in the sense that here on the, Z on the Zimbabwean side are all these hotels and things. And here, right there, on the Zambian side, is Livingston, which is Zambia's fourth largest city, named after David Livingston, fourth largest city, and the fastest growing city. And here is the bridge, a uh, rail and road bridge uh, across there. And here was the where all the waterfalls and this big gorge, and then goes round, 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 through 27 sets of rapids. So, um, you might think that this is not a very uh, promising landscape for the wilderness myth, or certainly for the visual side of the wilderness myth. But what um, Stephen Robinson did, which had not occurred to anybody before, is that he went down into it as a photographer. And if you go down into this gorge, you immediately see that you cannot see anything else. Right? Livingston is right above there. I mean, about 10 kilometers back. But there's tourism infrastructure right there. And you go into the gorge, and then he took his camera and he put it up, up and down to show a vertical shot rather than a horizontal shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and to go along with that, there's a whole rafting industry and bungee jumping and the paddling or what they have to fly like what call. So there's a lot of concentrated tourism in this gorge, which is all about exploiting not the wild aesthetic, not the uh, the view of a stone age nature, an empty landscape, but exploring the truly wild physical qualities of moving water, which is what you do if you're a, if you're a white water raptor. So the people have a tactile, really more a tactile than a visual experience, um, which can go on in close proximity to urbanism and industry and so forth, with no competition. Uh, so what we have here, I think, developing in the adventure tour that or adrenaline sports, it's a very concentrated wilderness experience um, that leaves a very small footprint and is, in a sense, genuine. Um, this is not about some manufactured wilderness, it's about the true wilderness of moving water, and allows other forms of development to go on. Still, the revenues are concentrated in the hands of the small elite, but at least it's not ruling out other forms of development. Okay? So I'm going to end with that, and I'll take any questions and I'm going to be with you off to my convalescence. Uh, sure. <laughs> two things. One, and, and then just on that is that the distribution of the wealth and the money that comes in is a political decision and an economic decision that could be made differently. In other words, the money that's generated could be distributed differently. But the actual question I wanted to ask is about the preservation of the wildlife and the preservation of something that's a treasure for, for generations, the, 
the elephants, the, the white rhinos, the, uh, you mentioned the Ngorogoro uh, crater. Uh, uh, how, how do you find enough land for the giraffes and the zebras and the wildebeests and the, I mean, the white rhinos and whatever without creating national parks and, and, and preserving some land where these animals can migrate and live? Yeah, yeah. You. Two, two questions. Um, the first one on the political decision. Uh, so I'm an anthropologist, I'm going to say it's a cultural decision. Um, and the reason, one of the things that comes up, if you saw, I showed you that picture of that tropical rainforest. And the, uh, the, the initial idea of campfires, that local communities should benefit from tourists who come to look at that rainforest. Um, but when you talk to government officials, particularly at the district, which is the lowest level here, so essentially like counties, and they're the middle of all this. They say, well, why should this local community benefit from this rainfall? <coughs> Build it. Right? They didn't put any labor into it. It's just there. You know, it's like I live close to the Raritan River. Uh, it flows reasonably. It flows within, uh, you know, four or, four or five hundred meters of my house. I could potentially put up a toll booth there and charge um, there were boats and things I could charge them a toll. But no one would accept that. Um, similarly, very few people really believe, even in this campfire, but really believe that local people deserve and have earned the money from that rainforest. So this, and this is, goes back to John Locke's idea that you know, they let the labor theory out, right? That the value of something comes from the way in which people mix their labor. In fact, what I tried to explain to people about this is that in fact it's a sacred forest and people protected it, made sacrifices by not cultivating it so much. But even that isn't really mixing the labor, it's the opposite, it's leaving something alone. Then I'm going to the other part of your question about preserving wildlife. And that, yes, if you have migratory species, something like wildebeest, they require a lot of land to move around. Um, I'm very taken by the idea of domesticating these animals. Because as long as they're wild, it's not going to be possible for them to actually do anything useful. <laughs> and so you have you have some of the poorest people in the world living around these animals that some of the wealthiest people in the world want to come see. But the mechanisms for getting the money from the wealthiest people to the poorest people are broken because of all the, all the means that I mentioned, when Zimbabwe became truly authoritarian, then they were really, really broken and irreparable. So, what if we just scrapped all that and said, let's find a way for these peasant communities to benefit directly from the labor of these animals? And in fact, there were some experiments of this in the 1990s, where elephants were semi-domesticated, first to carry tourists, but that's still not the same thing in the but then also to carry fence poles, they did some experiments with elephants plowing. Um, wildebeest have also been bred up as you know, meat animals. Uh, same thing with, <coughs> with Cape buffalo. Um, so, and then, of course, the, the then the myth is gone, right? All the mystique is gone. But the other good thing about domesticating animals is that it guarantee against extinction, right? Uh, the Asian elephant is doing pretty well by comparison to the African elephant. In many places, because people value the work that the Asian elephant does in forest forestry in particular. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say at least it's worth it's worth trying, it's worth experimenting with, and the domesticated animal as well takes a lot less space and therefore frees up other things with knowledge. And we have Europe, of course. I have got rid of the domesticated <coughs> And you might say that natural resource driven development is much, much less likely to be successful than agricultural, or let's say wilderness-driven development is only going to get you so far, but domestication-driven development may push you all the way. That's fine. Yes, please. What happens to the predators in a case like that? They're not very <laughs> desirable if you're trying to raise a little meat from the table. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people are very, very good line, but they do tend to be a lot of space. Um, um, she has well. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you there. I have to say, I'm just thinking about this idea. Uh, <laughs> um, it may not be that every species makes it. 